The Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota. It's my very great pleasure to introduce my esteemed colleague, William Dudley, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Bill became the 10th President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in January 2009. Before that, he had served as Head of the Markets Group and Director of the System Open Market Account since 2007. Now these dates should sound ominous to you. 2007 marked the beginning of the global financial crisis. January 2009 was the middle of the shocking deterioration of the labor market associated with the Great Recession. Bill amply demonstrated an extraordinary commitment to public service in playing a key role in the development of the Fed's rapid and extensive response to the crisis and recession. Before joining the uh, New York Bank in 2007, Bill was a partner and managing director at Goldman Sachs and was the firm's chief U.S. economist for a decade. Prior to joining Goldman Sachs in 1986, he was a vice president of the former Morgan Guarantee Trust Company. Now, some observers have expressed unease about former employees of Wall Street firms serving in public policy roles. I've been, had the, uh, the good fortune and the privilege of being Bill's colleague on the Federal Open Market Committee since October 2009, when I became president of the Minneapolis Fed. He's been a tremendous colleague in that capacity. I've been impressed by his relentless dedication to our dual mandate of promoting price stability and promoting maximum employment. In my view, all of his wise contributions to the committee's deliberations have been shaped entirely by consideration of the public interest. And at the same time, the committee and I have benefited tremendously from the knowledge of markets that Bill accumulated through his pre-Fed private sector experience. Bill received his doctorate in economics from the University of California, Berkeley in 1982, and a bachelor's degree from the New College of Florida in 1974. Uh, in 2012, he was appointed chairman of the Committee on, Glo uh, on the Global Financial System of the Bank for International Settlements, or the BIS. Previously, he served as chairman of the Committee on Payment and Settlement Systems of the BIS from 2009 to 2012. He's a member of the Board of Directors of the BIS and chairman of the Economic Club of New York, which is a somewhat of a competing organization to ours, I guess. Um, th they have a little bit of a head start, but I think we're catching up very nicely. Uh, so uh, one personal note about Bill, uh, so you might know that Chairman Ben Bernanke, former Chairman Ben Bernanke, is uh, writing uh, his book about his experiences uh, as Chairman of the Fed, and that book is going to be called The Courage to Act, and it's referring to the courage that uh, people like Bill showed during the, during the crisis and developing uh, uh, extraordinary responses to, to the events that were unfolding, and uh, I think quite, quite rightly referring to that, that courage. But actually, you don't need to go to that to think about, to recognize that Bill has great courage. In the shadow of Yankee Stadium recently, he declared himself to be a Red Sox fan. <laughs> now that is true courage. So without further ado, please welcome Bill Dudley. So I got a uh, Bronx cheer in uh, response to that. Uh, but I, you know, I thought, you know, in the favor of uh, you know Fed transparency, I had to be honest. Uh, who, 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 where were my rooting interests actually uh, lie? So good morning. It's great to be here. I want to thank uh, Nuriana for that very kind introduction. I also want to thank him for uh, all his service at, on the Federal Reserve. Uh, he's been a great colleague. Uh, I've really appreciated all that he's brought to the table. He's uh, very much stimulated my own thinking, challenged my own thinking. A uh, very valued co colleague uh, at the FOMC and uh, will be greatly missed when he moves on to his next, uh, next uh, assignment. I also want to th uh, thank uh, Chris Cummings, who's going to be uh, moderating the Q&As. Uh, Chris is the first vice president of the New York Fed. Uh, she's retiring at, at the end of the month, um, and she's just been a hugely important partner uh, for me at the bank. So I want to thank uh, Minnesota for lending her to me and the bank uh, for all these years. Uh, obviously, it's a pleasure to be here in Minneapolis and, and to speak to all of you. As chairman of the Economic Club of New York, 
you know, I particularly appreciate the role that the Economic Club of Minneapolis has played in organizing this event. And I think the world's big enough for, for both of us. <laughs> in my remarks, I'm going to focus on the economic outlook and the implications of that outlook for monetary policy. And today I come before you as the proverbial two-armed economist. On one hand, the economy's forward momentum has slowed sharply during the first half of the year. And inflation remains below the level the FOMC views as consistent with price stability. But on the other hand, I think it's also fair to say that we're still making progress towards our dual mandate objectives. However, recent solid job gains and the further decline in the unemployment rate have occurred only because productivity growth has slowed markedly. During the remainder of the year, I do expect economic growth to pick up somewhat. However, productivity growth will also likely rise. So there does remain some uncertainty about whether the growth will be strong enough to continue to lead to further uh, improvement in the labor market. With respect to inflation, as long as growth remains strong enough to lead to further improvement in labor market conditions, and that's an important caveat, I am becoming more confident that inflation will move up towards the FOMC's 2% objective over the medium term. The firming of inflation that I anticipate reflects my expectation that resource utilization will gradually increase and the fact that some of the factors that were pulling down inflation, such as lower oil and gas prices and a firmer dollar, have already stabilized or partly reversed. So putting this all together, I still think it's likely that conditions will be appropriate to begin monetary policy normalization later this year. But the likelihood and timing will depend on the economic outlook, and that will be largely shaped by the incoming economic data. When the FOMC begins to raise short-term rates, this will occur in a very different environment uh, than in the past. Reserves in the banking system are very plentiful, reflecting the large increase in the Federal Reserve's balance sheet that's occurred over the past few years. But this circumstance should not adversely affect our ability to push the federal funds rate up into a higher target range. We have appropriate tools to push up short-term interest rates. However, the liftoff may not go so smoothly in terms of the impact on financial asset prices. After all, liftoff will represent a significant regime shift after more than six years at the zero lower bound. More important for financial asset prices than the precise timing of liftoff is the expected trajectory of short-term interest rates over the few years following liftoff. Most likely, this will be a shallow upward path. Because of the persistent headwinds associated with the recent financial crisis, the level of sh real short-term interest rates consistent with a neutral monetary policy seems to be considerably lower now than it's been in the past. And if potential GDP growth going forward is much lower due to slower labor force growth and slower productivity growth, the long-run equilibrium real short-term rate is also likely to be lower in the future even after those headwinds fully dissipate. But all that said, we have to recognize the fact that there still is going to be considerable uncertainty about the path of short-term interest rates. After all, the economic outlook is uncertain. Moreover, the appropriate stance of policy will be influenced by how financial market conditions respond to the Federal Reserve's actions. All else equal, if financial conditions tighten sharply, then we'll likely to move more slowly. In contrast, if financial conditions were not to tighten at all or were even uh, to ease a bit, then assuming the economic outlook hadn't changed significantly, we'd likely to have to move more quickly. In the end, we will adjust the policy stance to support the financial market conditions that we deem are the most consistent with our employment and inflation objectives. Now, as always, what I have to say reflects my own views and not necessarily those of the FOMC or the Federal Reserve System. Now, turning first for a little more detail on the economic outlook, real GDP growth appears to have slowed sharply during the first half of this year. Based on the revision we received last week, first quarter real GDP actually contracted at a 0% annualized rate. And although most projections anticipate a pickup in growth to around 2% or slightly higher in the current quarter, there's little question that economic growth has slowed significantly from last year's second half pace. So what's going on? Why is growth slowed and what does this portend for the remainder of the year? 
As I see it, the contraction in GDP growth in the first quarter represents a mix of factors. These include another unseasonally cold and snowy winter, a sharp contraction in oil and gas investment, a deterioration in the trade balance due in large part to the stronger dollar and sluggish foreign demand, and a slowdown in consumer spending growth after a very strong fourth quarter. After adjusting for weather effects, I think seasonal adjustment issues probably also played some role. For example, real defense spending has declined eight times in the past nine years in the first quarter. This suggests we have a seasonal adjustment problem with respect to defense spending. But I judge that this has had only a modest effect on measured real GDP growth. Now, because weather effects are by their nature temporary, the widely held expectation coming into the second quarter was that we'd have a sharp rebound in growth similar to what took place last year. But the current data that we've received to date suggests that the rebound has been relatively muted. I think this is because of some of the non-weather factors evident in the first quarter, such as the drag from the sharp drop in oil and gas investment, have persisted into the second quarter. Also, real disposable income growth has slowed over the past few months as aggregate hours works have grown more slowly and crude oil and gasoline prices have partially recovered. This means that the fundamentals for consumer spending, which were very strong at the beginning of the year, are now not as strong right now. Nevertheless, putting all the pieces together, my view is that growth will likely pick up further over the remainder of the year. This judgment reflects several factors. First, some of the forces that have been restraining growth are likely to fade later this year. For example, consider oil and gas investment. The US oil and gas rig count dropped precipitously during the first quarter, but the rate of decline has slowed during the current quarter. Combined with the partial recovery we've seen in crude oil prices, this implies that oil and gas investment is likely to become less of a drag on growth during the second half of the year. Second, business fixed investment outside of oil and gas seems likely to advance, reflecting strong fundamentals. For example, the cost of capital remains very low and cash flows are very high. Third, there's plenty of room for further gains in residential investment. Housing starts have been only running at about an annual rate of about a million a year so far this year. This is low relative to both the rate of household formation that one would expect given under the underlying demographics, and it's also low relative to the rate of job formation. Moreover, continuing improvement in mortgage credit availability should support the demand for new housing. Household credit worthiness is improving as the scars of the financial crisis heal. And underwriting standards may be relaxed somewhat in response to the excellent performance of recent mortgage ventures in terms of very low credit losses. Fourth, household finances generally are in good shape with debt service burdens at historically low levels. <coughs> household bar borrowing has been rising only very slowly and the personal saving rate is somewhat elevated relative to what one would expect given the level of household net worth, which is high relative to income. This suggests that if households do become more confident about their finances, consumer spending could grow at least as fast as income growth over the remainder of the year. So that's all the good news. <laughs> but I can't be completely confident about this forecast. After all, several times during this expansion, we've been fooled by sharp rises in the growth rate that appeared to presage a sustained pickup, that's, but that subsequently proved fleeting. Moreover, faster consumption growth is not a given. It will depend in part on the pace of employment and wage growth. A downside risk is that wage growth stays subdued, which would undercut consumer spending. And the trade sector looks likely to remain a drag on growth over the remainder of the year. Although the dollar has depreciated slightly on a broad trade weighted basis recently, it's still more than 10% higher than it was a year ago. Despite the sharp slowdown in growth evident during the first half of the year, we have seen continued job gains, and the unemployment rate has been sort of flat to lower over the past year. Consequently, we still seem to be making progress towards our objection objective of maximum employment in the context of price stabilities. To today's payroll and household employment rates can indicates that that progress did continue in May. Even with a weak, a weak payroll employment report in March, job gains this year have averaged almost 220,000 per month. 
The gain in May was even stronger at 280,000 jobs, and it was widespread across a broad range of industries. On the wage side, although the 12-month change in average hourly earnings is still low at 2.3%, it's a bit higher than what we've seen in recent years, where we've averaged around 2%. So we maybe are starting to see a slight uptick in wages. At the same time, there are still some ways to go. The unemployment rate has been pretty flat over the last few months. Uh, today's report, we were at 5.5%. And the levels of part-time workers who are working part-time for economic reasons and the number of people that are unemployed over the long term, both of those remain elevated. So there's still some ways to go. Now, so we've had a combination of slow output growth but solid job gains. And what that means is that the productivity growth has been unusually weak with non-farm business productivity declining significantly during the past two quarters. Over the last year, non-farm business productivity has risen only 0.3%. It also implies that the future path of productivity growth is going to be important in determining the outlook for employment growth going forward and the prospects for further progress in U.S. labor market conditions. Now, because it's unclear exactly why productivity growth has slowed recently, it's difficult to be confident about what productivity growth is going to do in the future. One reading of the data is that some of the slowing seems likely to be persistent. For example, the weakness in capital spending we've seen during the past few years means that the contribution to productivity from capital deepening has dropped sharply. Also, one could argue that the U.S. labor market appears to have become a bit less dynamic perhaps due in part to an older workforce. We're seeing less movement of workers across jobs, and this could lead to a less efficient allocation of worker skills, which it also could hurt productivity growth. That said, it seems unlikely to me that productivity growth will remain as weak as it's been over the past year. There's considerable evidence that technological progress continues at a healthy pace, just look at some of the recent advances that have occurred in healthcare, oil and gas extraction, and the development of smartphones. Moreover, because it takes time for technological advances to be adapted broadly across the economy, it seems unlikely that the productivity gains from recent innovations have yet been fully realized. Now, because I'm uncertain about the near-term trend of GDP growth, and I'm also uncertain about the near-term trend for productivity growth, that means I'm doubly uncertain about whether we'll see further progress in the labor market over the remainder of the year. There are many different possible outcomes to consider. For example, if real GDP growth were to pick up more than productivity, then employment growth would likely remain sufficiently firm to lead to further tightening in the labor market. But if the reverse occurred, with productivity growth picking up by more than real GDP growth, then payroll gains could slow, even as real GDP strengthened. Now, in contrast to my uncertainties about growth in the labor market, I am becoming more confident that inflation will return to our 2% objective over the medium term, as long as the labor market continues to improve. That's an important caveat. The reasons here are straightforward. First, a number of factors that threaten to keep inflation below our 2% objective appear to be transitory. In this camp, I put the sharp decline in oil and gas prices that began in the middle of 2014, and the weakness that we've seen in non-petroleum import prices due to the strength of the dollar. When the effects of these transitory influences wane, inflation will move closer to our 2% objective for the personal consumption expenditure deflator. Second, the tightening of the labor market may soon lead to some strengthening in the labor compensation trend. We saw a sign of that today in the employment report with average hourly earnings ticking up to 2.3%. Although recent data as a whole are not yet, in my mind, conclusive, I find it noteworthy that the four-quarter change in the employment cost index for civilian workers, which I think is the most reliable indicator of, of labor cost trends, rose at a 2.6% rate as of the first quarter of this year, up from around 2% uh, the first quarter of 2014. Also, work done by my staff suggests we're at the point in, in terms of a labor market recovery where in the past, we've typically seen a pickup in wage compensation. Third, the risk that inflation expectations, were, which are very important in influ influencing inflation outcomes, might become unanchored to the downside, seems to have diminished. In particular, the anxieties created by the decline in break-even inflation compensation measures that are based on the relative yield on nominal treasuries versus treasury inflation protected securities have lessened. 
For example, one measure that people at the Fed look at very closely, the five-year forward, five-year inflation compensation measure, so this is an expectation of what inflation is going to be five years in the future, has climbed by about a quarter percentage point since its low point in late January. So what are the implications of all this for the, of the economic outlook for U.S. monetary policy? Well, as the FOMC noted in its most recent statement in late April, the committee is looking for two conditions to be satisfied to start the monetary policy normalization process. Quote, further improvement in the labor market, unquote, and that the committee is, quote, reasonably confident that inflation will return to the FOMC's objective over the medium term. I think these are reasonable criteria. I would also note that these criteria are not independent of one another. All else equal, for example, further improvement in the labor market should make one more confident about the inflation outlook. But improvement in the labor market, while necessary, is not a sufficient condition. For example, if labor market improvement were not accompanied by a meaningful uptick in wage compensation, and if inflation expectations also fell, then one likely would not be reasonably confident about inflation returning to the 2% objective, even though you're seeing labor market improvement. For me at present, the uncertainties rest more on the outlook for the labor market than on inflation. If the labor market continues to improve and inflation expectations remain well anchored, then I would expect, in the absence of some dark cloud gathering over the growth outlook, to support a decision to begin normalizing monetary policy later this year. When the normalization process starts and we raise the target range for the federal funds rate, what should we anticipate? Well, I expect a smooth liftoff in terms of the ability of the FOMC to raise the federal funds rate up into a new higher range. Less clear is what the financial market reaction will be to that action. Will it be more like the turbulent taper tantrum of 2013, in which the market responds to Chairman Bernanke's remarks that we might at some point in the future begin to taper our asset purchase and respond in a quite uh, abrupt manner with yields moving very much higher? Or instead, will we see the benign response when the FOMC actually began to taper its asset purchases in 2014? So there's a pretty wide range of potential outcomes. So let me consider these two issues in turn. I am very confident the FOMC has the tools in place uh, to ensure that we can raise successfully the federal, federal funds rate into a new higher target range when the time comes to do so. This, re represent, this reflects several factors. Most importantly, we've demonstrated that the interest rate we pay on banks' reserve balances, what we call IOER, which is our primary tool to raise the federal funds rate, combined with daily overnight reverse repo operations, which is a supplemental tool to help put a, a floor under money, rates, money market rates, we've shown already that this is effective in keeping the federal fund rate well within the FOMC's desired target range. Moreover, in the unlikely event that the rates we initially selected for the IOER and the overnight reverse repurchase agreements rates were insufficient to move the federal funds rate into the desired range, we could always alter the level of these rates or the spread between these rates so we could push the federal fund rate into the desired range. Finally, we also have other tools such as the term deposit facility and the ability to do term reverse repo that could be used if needed to achieve the targeted range for the federal fund rate. I don't expect that these tools will be proved to be necessary, but it's nice to have them available should we need to deal with un unanticipated contingencies. So we have a couple belts and an extra pair of suspenders. Uh, so we think we're in very good shape. How will financial markets react to the onset of normalization? My own view is that there is likely to be some turbulence. After all, liftoff will re re represent a regime change after more than six years at the zero lower bound. Recognizing this, we have a responsibility to minimize the amount of potential turbulence by communicating clearly in order to reduce uncertainty about the conditions surrounding liftoff and the likely aftermath of liftoff. This means being clear about what factors are important in driving the timing of liftoff. However, this does not mean providing advance notice about precisely when liftoff will occur, because the timing should depend on the incoming economic news and how this influences the economic outlook. So I would argue if you pay attention to the incoming economic news and you listen to our assessment about how the economic outlook is evolving, then I think you're going to be able to judge for yourself very well uh, when liftoff is likely to occur. Now, what also matters for financial asset prices is, is not just the timing of liftoff, but is the, the post 
liftoff trajectory of short-term rates over the medium to longer term. In fact, I think this should be more important than the particular month in which the normalization process starts. On this score, I think it's hard to be precise about the expected path of short-term rates. That's because it depends on two factors. One, how the economic outlook evolved, which depends in part on how loose or tight monetary policy actually is at a given level of short-term interest rates. And two, how financial market conditions broadly react to changes in the level of short-term rates. Now, my own view is that the upward trajectory of short-term rates is likely to be relatively shallow. This reflects several factors. First, the lack of strong forward momentum in the economy, despite the very low level of short-term rates that we have in place today, suggests that U.S. monetary policy is not accommodated as we might think. In, the, in particular, the lack of strong momentum suggests that the real equilibrium funds rate today is considerably lower than the 2% rate assumed in the standard Taylor Rule formulation. Work done by two of my Federal Reserve colleagues, Thomas Laubach and John Williams, suggests that the so-called neutral real federal funds rate today may be close to zero. This presumably reflects the still persistent headwinds from the financial crisis, <clears throat> such as the constraints on mortgage credit available to prospective borrowers with lower FICO scores. Second, one might expect that it will still take additional time for these headwinds to fully subside. This implies that the neutral short-term rate may be depressed for some time. And third, my assessment is wherever we're going, we're probably going to stop at a lower rate than we have in the past, because I think the long-run equilibrium rate is lowered now, reflecting the likelihood that the potential real GDP growth is lower as well, due to slower growth of the labor force, reflecting the aging of the population, and the more moderate productivity growth performance that we're likely to see going forward. Now, another important factor that will affect the trajectory of short-term rates is how financial market conditions react to the rise in short-term rates. Monetary policy works on the economy through how it affects financial market conditions. Economic conditions at any point in time warrant a particular set of financial market conditions so the FOMC can best achieve its objectives of maximum employment and price stability. The FOMC chooses a policy stance to help support financial market conditions that are consistent with the economic outcomes that it's trying to achieve. Now, an important aspect of the current financial market conditions is the very low level of bond term premium around the go globe. Bond yields have gone up over the last week or so, but still, bond term premium are still very low. If a small rise in short-term rates were to lead to a very abrupt increase in term premium and a big rise in bond yields, resulting in a significant tightening of financial condi conditions, then the Federal Reserve would likely move more slowly, all else equal. As an example, consider the experience in 1994-95. That was a, a tightening cycle. Bond yields rose very sharply during that cycle, and the Federal Reserve ultimately tightened much less than what was priced in by market participants, in part because they were getting the tightening of financial market conditions from the rise in the bond market. Conversely, if term premium and bond yields were to remain low, and the economic outlook suggested that financial conditions needed to be tighter, and, it, and when the Fed rose short-term rates, but that didn't generate the re desired outcome, then the FOMC would likely to have to do more in terms of short-term rates. The 2004 to 2007 tightening cycle might be a good example of this. The FOMC ultimately pushed the federal funds rate up to a peak of five and a quarter percent, in part because the earlier rise in short-term rates was generally ineffective in tightening financial, commission, financial market conditions sufficiently over this period. So this means that there's uncertainty about the trajectory of short-term rates from two distinct sources. The economic outlook and what setting of financial conditions this implies is as appropriate and what setting of short-term rates is consistent with the financial market conditions that the FOMC is seeking to generate. This also suggests that market participants should be cautious in interpreting the summary of economic projection dot plots that show the FOMC participants' modal outlooks for the short-term rate trajectory. If the participants were to provide confidence in around these paths, which we don't provide, I, I expect it to be very wide because the economic outlook is uncertain and the linkage between the instrument of monetary policy, the federal funds rate, and financial conditions is loose and variable. So in conclusion, I believe the FOMC is continuing to make progress towards our dual mandate objectives. However, I have become somewhat more uncertain about the growth outlook given the lack of a sharp rebound in economic activity in recent months following a very weak first quarter. 
With respect to inflation, as long as I see, as I see further improvement in the labor market and longer-term inflation expectations remain well anchored, I am somewhat less worried that inflation will stay too low. Thus, putting it all together, I continue to expect that monetary policy normalization is likely to begin later this year. Longer term, I expect that the trajectory of short-term rates after liftoff will be relatively shallow. This is due in part to my reading that monetary policy today is not as accommodated as one might think, judging just from the level of short-term rates. But the path will not be determined by my forecast. It will be determined by how the economic outlook evolves and how financial market conditions respond to monetary policy. So I expect that there will be many twists and turns in the road ahead. And as we make this journey, I will do my best to explain what I'm seeing and how I think I might react as conditions change in the future. So thank you much, very much for your kind attention. I'd like Christine to come up to the stage and we'll take a few questions. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Tom Nickerson from Agribank. And I was wondering, what's your take on the recent IMF comments this week, especially given the uh, specificity of those comments? Well, there's a lot of uh, views on what the Fed should do. In fa fact, there's a lot of views at, around the FOMC table about what the Fed should do. So I don't think it's any great consequence if there's one more opinion on what the Federal Reserve should do. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the economic data is going to drive what we do, uh, and that's going to drive the policy decision. People have different opinions about how the economy is going to evolve and therefore the timing of when the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates. So I'm certainly not troubled by another uh, opinion. Here's a question. Devin Foley with uh, Intellectual Takeout, just one of the younger folks out here and just looking towards the future. Historically, I understand, you know, if you're, we're looking at a, an environment of rising interest rates and historically six to eight percent or so in the national debt has been an interest rate going back many decades, high of 14 percent or so in the 1980s. We have a 17 trillion dollar national debt. How do you see rising interest rates impacting that? and the ability for our government to continue providing services if a much lar a growing portion of its tax revenue is going to have to be devoted towards paying off its debt or simply sustaining it. Thank you. So the question gets at the issue of uh, debt service cost. And one thing that's happened on the favorable side over the last few years is that the Fed has kept interest rates very low and bond yields have fallen. Uh, debt service costs for the country to, to, f f uh, to pay, pay on its debt have come down a lot. If we're successful and we actually generate a strong economic recovery and interest rates rise, those debt service costs will rise in, in the future. Uh, I, don't think, I, think that would, I think that's actually a good thing, not a bad thing. We want an economic recovery and we want a sustainable economic recovery and we want to have a more normal level of interest rates and higher debt service costs will be a price that we pay. I think that price is, is very affordable as long as the Federal Reserve does its job and keeps inflation under control over the medium to longer term. Uh, the way you have a real debt service cost problem is if you let inflation get out of hand, that's how you get the 14% interest rates you saw back in the early 1990s. You know, we have a dual mandate objection, maximum sustainable employment in the context of price stability. Uh, we take that second part of our mandate very seriously. And so as long as we keep inflation uh, you know, around our 2% uh, objective, uh, I think the interest rates won't be so high as to create huge problems in terms of debt service costs. But you're absolutely right. Debt service costs probably will go up somewhat. Uh, but remember, the economy is doing better. That's generating revenue for the government. And so that's an important, important offset. So it's not something that I would be greatly concerned about as long as the Federal Reserve does its job. Hi, Craig Bishop, RBC Wealth Management, Minneapolis. Um, could you comment on the, um, uh, the disconnect, not just at the Fed in the U.S., but other central banks as well that are going full bore as far as providing stimulus to the market, keeping economies stable, keeping growth stable, but there's a lack of fiscal policy to complement that, which to me it seems to be if that were to kick into gear would be the thing that would really drive growth out of this kind of uh, stumbling 2.5% level we've been at for some time. Well, it's very dangerous for central bankers to opine on fiscal policy. Uh, and that applies to me, too. <laughs> uh, look, I think in the United States, uh, pol fiscal policy now is pretty neutral. So I don't think it's a huge constraint on the economy. Uh, that was not the case a couple years ago, where I think the fiscal drag really was making it hard for the Federal Reserve to achieve its objectives. 
where fiscal policy plays, I think, a bigger role and is creating more, 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 more consequences in Europe, uh, where you still see a, a move towards austerity in a number of countries, which runs smack into co uh, conflict with a very expansive monetary policy. So I think in the United States, the fiscal outlook is not a huge constraint for our ability to be successful uh, in achieving our objectives at the current time. It was much a bigger, it was a bigger, much bigger hill to climb uh, a few years ago. So I think, you know, broadly speaking, you know, the budget deficit in the U.S. is, you know, at a level where debt to GDP is stable or, or, or gently declining. Uh, could we do more in terms of fiscal consolidation over the longer run? Perhaps. Uh, I think most people who look at the fiscal situation in the U.S. feel that the real challenges are really around longer-term entitlement spending, especially for Medicare. Uh, because the, but even there, the news is somewhat better because healthcare cost inflation has, has moderated significantly. So even on the healthcare side, the news is quite a bit better now than what we were expecting uh, from a few years ago. Smith with uh, Articat. Quick question on uh, the U.S. dollar. With the strength in the U.S. dollar, do you think it's a net good or bad for the economy? And do you care to offer any views of the uh, near future? This is a tough crowd. You ask a central banker about fiscal policy and the dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we leave the dollar to the U.S. Treasury to opine about. It's a long-standing tradition. Uh, you know, my, my, my view of the dollar is, look, the, the, the dollar is just one, one aspect of financial market conditions. So financial market conditions are the dollar, the stock market, the level of long-term interest rates, credit spreads, credit availability. And so clearly, as the dollar moves up or down, that affects financial market conditions. And we need to factor that into our outlook for the economy and then the appropriate monetary policy uh, that, we, that we seek. But uh, the, 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 the Federal Reserve is uh, very studious about avoiding talking about you know, what level of the dollar they want. That's really the job of the Treasury. Uh, we take the dollar as it is, and it's, and it's just an input to our, our monetary policy deliberations. One last question, maybe. Uh, good afternoon. This is Chris McGrann with Alliance Bernstein. Maybe we'll get you back to uh, your core comfort zone, but <laughs> there's been some disagreement maybe among some of your members about what the appropriate uh, level of unemployment is for when you start to maybe potentially raise rates. Would you share with us your views? Well, I think the, you know, the, the reason why there's uncertainty about when to start tightening in part is, is there's, there's a number of different parameters that matter. One is the momentum of the economy. So how fast are we going to use up the available slack that we have in the economy? Two, there's how about how much slack do we have? And one aspect of that is, is the unemployment rate a, a, a sufficient statistic in that regard? I think there's a lot of people, uh, I certainly put myself in this camp, that think the unemployment rate overstates the degree of tightness in the labor market right now because we see a lot of people that are working part-time for economic reasons. We've seen the participation rate in the U.S. come down pretty sharply over the last few years. That suggests that there are discouraged workers that have left the labor market who will come back in the labor market as the labor market tightens. So, you know, we put those, all those things together, it's, it's pretty reasonable to think that people would have different views on, on when is the precise time, timing to, to begin, uh, to, begin to, to lift off. I think in, you know, the current environment, I don't think there's a huge disagreement uh, among the FOMC because we're missing on the inflation objective and the unemployment objective on the same side. And so, you know, if the inflation was above our target and the unemployment rate was too high, I think that would create a much more comp complex monetary policy debate. But the fact that inflation is too low, if we let the unemployment rate fall further before moving, well, that's actually good in some ways because it actually will help us better, more quickly achieve our, our, our inflation outcome. But I, you know, I, think that, you know, I think it's reasonable to, to disagree about you know, where, where the so-called full employment rate is. Um, the longer we go without much in the way of wage inflation, you'll, you'll, and the, the, the tighter the labor market gets, if you don't see wage inflation, people will tend to lower their idea of where full employment is. If we see more in wage inflation, people will tend to raise their idea of where full, full employment is. We don't really know where that number is. People have estimates, but those estimates are going to be modified based on what they see uh, going forward. So this will need to be the last question. Uh, V.V. Chari, Economics Department, University of Minnesota. So again, back to the core question. In your remarks, you repeatedly talked about normalization of monetary policy. Uh, I'm not sure I, I fully understand why normalization is desirable. 
the experience of the last seven years has been decried by a lot of people, but uh, Milton Friedman, for one, argued that desirable monetary policy should attempt to keep short-term interest rates at or close to zero. Um, I'm trying to understand what uh, the FOMC and you think would be the significant substantial risks of continuing the kind of monetary policy that we have followed over the last seven years for perhaps the next seven years? Well, I think there'd be a, a couple risks. Risk number one is if monetary policy was kept at a accommodative setting and the economy continued to grow fast enough to continue to push down the unemployment rate, at some point we actually would run out, run out of excess resources in the labor market. We'd see higher wage pressure, we'd see higher inflation. That wouldn't be a very good outcome because then the Federal Reserve would have to come along and raise interest rates sharply, and that would probably run the risk of pushing the U.S. economy back in, into a recession. So we're, we're, we're trying to avoid that sort of stop-start type of uh, uh, element to, to monetary policy. The second issue, of course, is that uh, very, very low interest rates you know, do have potential risk to financial stability. And so we also have to continue to monitor, is this very low period of, 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 of this period of very low interest rates, is that creating uh, distortions or imbalances in the financial markets that could f subsequently f threaten the stability of the financial system? We don't see anything now uh, that's you know, particularly troublesome in that regard. But I, if, you told, if, if, if we kept short-term rates low at zero indefinitely, I'm almost certain that trouble would arise uh, on that score at some point. Thank you very much. The Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota.